that you are saved? Yes, sir. Do you know that? You see, we've been mimicking the journey of Christ over the last several weeks, and there's a particular reason for that. And it's that we live in a world that's touchy-feely, warm and fuzzy, and we always want to be in this smiling, encouraging, uplifted mood mode. And that's not that's not the story. That's after, not before. You realize, I hope and pray to God above, what it took to get you to heaven? Amen. Do you know the price that's been paid? That we might have assurance and confidence in our Lord Jesus Christ? That this day, no matter how bad it is, it's going to be a better day one day? Do you know that, right? Amen. Do you know? Don't, it's rhetorical. For God's sake, don't raise your hand and tell me. I don't need to know. God does, and you do too. Are you going to heaven? Yep. Are you going to heaven? Do you know that you know that you know that if you die today, that you'd go to heaven? Do you know that? Yes. If you don't know that, you need to talk to somebody. Do you hear? You say, Brother Lynn, that's my business, not yours. No, that's God's business. And because it's God's business, it needs to be somebody's business. Amen? Amen. Uh, there's no way on God's earth I can fathom that any one of us that are decent, reasonable human beings could stand by the side of, of an interstate or a road and let a small child walk out in traffic and not do something to stop that child or to save that child from impending doom, would you? Would you possibly stand there as a, car, as a child rushes out of the truck? Would you stand there and do nothing? You can ask it. In your heart and in your head, you've already answered, no, I wouldn't. Because many of us are parents. And if you're not, there's something ought to be in your heart that reaches out to those that can't help themselves, they need help. Amen? Amen? Well, that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus didn't, didn't make robots. He made, he made human beings. And He gave us the reasoning, ability, and capacity that we could understand that we all go somewhere we're spending time with somebody. Now, if you want to go up, you need to make that choice. If you don't want to go up, you're going to go down. And if that's what you want to do, go for it. And I realize we live in a world now that's cynical and, and, and skeptical, and they say, I don't really believe it. You know what? I understand one eternal truth, and eternal truth is this. It does not matter what you think. When you close your eyes this side, if you ain't prepared for the next night, you're going to have a real bad day. Amen? We're not celebrating people going to, to hell. We're not celebrating that people live eternally lost and doomed and damned and judged with God or with, without God. We're not, we're, not, we're not celebrating that. We're celebrating the fact that God gave His Son, His only Son, that every human being has the capacity to make a reasonable choice for Jesus. And that is, there's one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. There's one way and only one way to get out of this mess and into heaven, and that's through the cross and through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's just how it is. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant, completely irrelevant. The way that we think and feel about that, it is what it is. Can happen. If, bless you. If you don't like the diagnosis of cancer and you got cancer, that's just too bad, isn't it? Y'all help me. If you go to the doctor and he diagnoses you with a dread disease and you want to ignore that diagnosis, you're going to still die, right? But if you go to that doctor, that di doctor diagnoses you and you choose because you have a reasonable capacity to make a, a, a reasonable choice, and you understand that if I don't do something, I'm going to die, and you choose to do something, and you do all that you can, that's a good thing, isn't it? Why is it we mess this thing up with Jesus? Is that we're going to live and die. Every human being lives and dies. That's just how it is. When you took your first breath, you also began taking your last breath. I don't know what your expiration date is, nor mine, but I do know that every one of us will die, do you? Well, if we're going to die, don't you think we need to make preparation for what happens after death? Thus the journey. You and I have been planned with a purpose. Do you believe that? Yes. You're not an accident. You're not a happenstance. You're not just some mistake that occurred in, in, in the vast whatever of, of the cosmos. No. God sat down to his drawing board and on a sheet of human flesh and blood, he etched out you. You and me. And he poured into that etching flesh and blood and a part of his spirit. And he gave us breath and he gave us life and he gave us meaning and he gave us significance and he gave us a purpose. And that purpose we've talked about for the last several weeks. 
Not only are we planned for a purpose, we're created for community, we're formed for family, we're made for mission, and we are saved for service. Amen. Amen. If you understand even those few things, what it says is you are valuable. God needs you. God wants you. Yes, He wants you in a church. God, yes, He wants you, God willing, in this church. If this is where you want to be. But if you don't want to be in this church, you need to be somewhere serving God. You need to be somewhere where you can live out your purpose for Him. You are not here to take up space. You are not here to eat, drink, and be merry. You're not here to just hang out till you die. That's not why we're here. We are here so that while we're here, we can serve God in His kingdom, in His church, in humanity with the gifts and the graces that we have been bestowed and bequeathed so that somebody benefits with a fine hour being here among them. Amen. Is that okay? Let me read the Word of God. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. As for you all, you were dead. Notice the note of it. You were dead. You were dead. <laughs> dead in transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but, but, because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Now in order, in order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace, expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, so that no man can boast. Listen to this. Pay attention just for a second. For we are God's handiwork. We are God's creation. We are God's masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. That is a mind-blowing concept when you look at it. That you and I have been saved to serve. That you and I, men and women, boys and girls, of flesh and blood, that God looked at and God saw you and me. God created us and He didn't create us without a purpose of mind. And in God's cosmic idea and plan, God looked down and said, I need you. I need you. I, I created you. I formed you. I fashioned you. You are my one of masterpiece. I need you. I want you. I can use you. Isn't that great? My daddy was a woodworker. My, my grandpa did too. I've still got some of his tools and some of my great grandpa. I've got tools over there that's over 150 years old that my kid folk used to make wagon spokes and, and all kinds of things on the farm. When they passed, when they passed, they passed those tools on. And those, tool, those tools, every one of those tools, I don't know what they are now. They have no meaning now, significance now, because we don't ride in a horse and boat. We don't have surreys running around for the most part. But at some time in the past, some blacksmith took a piece of metal and forged and made these tools. And they did because there's a purpose behind these tools. This tool was needed to do this work on a particular farm equipment or farm item or farm element. Does that make sense? Yes. Just like today, you and I have hundreds and hundreds of tools. And every one of those tools have a unique and particular purpose, don't they? Except for a handful, and even they have a particular purpose. And so when we want to do something, we go get a particular tool for a specific job because that's the purpose of it, isn't it? This, plan, this pen, this pen is not to clean out my ears. This pen is not to stab paper. This pen is used to write with. Amen? Yes. This, plan, this pen has a plan. This pen has a purpose, doesn't it? Yes. It was created and manufactured.
perfected and meant for a particular purpose. Wasn't it? Well, that's you and I. God, God wants every one of us to know that He has created us, He has formed us and fashioned us and made us uniquely like we are so that the way that we are and whomever we are, that God can use us in His kingdom building effort in this church or another church so that He can use us as we invest ourselves in Him so that the kingdom can be built, souls can be saved, lives can be changed, and good can be done. Amen. And because of that, we need to understand that we have been saved to serve. We've been created not to take away life, but to add to life. Isn't that good? God help us. God help us. If the only thing anybody can say when we finally die, they come to our grave, is they stand there and look at us. They sure didn't make a lot of money. Come on, man. He was a great pastor. Or a great mother. That's cool. He was a great whatever. But wouldn't it be great? If whoever comes to the grave, our grave, can look over and say this, that person, life, and faith was such that it impacted me. I'm in church now because of him or her. I'm going to heaven because of him or her. I'm a better person because of him and her. Because if that's not the reason we exist, you tell me what it is. If the only reason we walk through this life and we put up with a mess on this side of heaven, if the only reason we do that is to make a paycheck, y'all help me. There's got to be more in life and living than making money, though we need it. I got that. But that is, that is incidental to the main purpose that we are here. The main purpose we are here is that we add ourselves to the mix so that when we end our days and we are put back into the dirt and our souls go into heaven, hopefully is that people can see and people can know that because we live, they're different. Every life matters. Yours does too. Amen. And so when we figure that out, God uses us to do great things. I want you to notice a few things just for a few minutes this morning. We've been created to serve God. Our call to salvation is a call to service. You and I have been created to serve God in some capacity. Jeremiah was told by God. Before I made you in your mother's womb, I chose you. Can you believe that? Before I made you in your mother's womb, I chose you. And I've called you and I've chosen you. And I've created you for a special particular service. Hallelujah. Put your name there. Man or woman, boy or girl, whoever you are, Lynn. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I chose you. I called you. I created you. I made you. I fashioned you. I formed you. I made you who you are because I knew I could use you down the road. Come on. Put your name there. And when you put your name there, that gives meaning and it gives significance to every one of us because we realize God needs me. Do you know how impactful that is? Y'all help me. I, have, I wasn't chosen on many teams when I was little because I was a little bitty thing with coat bottle glasses. I couldn't see how to catch anything, but I could run like the wind, hallelujah. But although I wasn't picked on many teams, it, it, I mean, it rocked me when somebody would look over and I wouldn't pick last because I'm the only one left standing, you know? It was really impactful to me when somebody looked over and said, Lynn, I want you on my team. Yes, you know? And what that did was it, it made me want to do more. Amen? Amen. If, you, if you're six foot whatever and you 200 something pounds all brawn and muscle, hallelujah. Because you will never feel my pain. You're, you, you have always been chosen, always been first, always been picked, always been somebody because you big and you burn. But that's little old bitty fellas, ladies. <laughs> Sometimes we struggle. And so it is a big deal when somebody picks us. Can I help you? God Almighty has looked down and picked every one of us. Do you hear me? God has looked down and God says, I want you and I want you and I want you and I want you and I need you and I want you. Will you come and join my team? Can you imagine that? That the God of all creation, the God of eternity, that God looks down and wants and needs me? Me. It's not like he has to have me. He offers me the privilege and you the privilege enough the privilege of being on his team 
plan for him for eternity. That blows my mind. We've been created to serve him. We've been saved to serve him. The scriptures just told us that we are not saved. We don't serve out of guilt or shame or some sense of duty, though that's a cool thing. We serve because we know how deeply we're loved. Amen. We serve because we know the depth of, of, of pain and misery that Jesus went through to allow us the privilege to know him in a deeper, better way, in a way that we can be related to him. Y'all don't know about y'all, I can only talk about myself, and I will, I can shut my mouth and get going. I love my wife. Y'all hear me? Love my wife. We've been married this year 26 years. <coughs> I went through misery to get her to marry me. Do you hear me? <laughs> now, come on now. Went through misery because she's been hurt, I've been hurt, and we, we, we have a story. But I love that woman, and I believe that I can make a life with her, and I was willing to put up with the human misery necessary to allow her the privilege to make up her mind because she could look through the stuff and the pain and the hurt of what had been and see the opportunities of what could be. And she said yes when I asked her. Is that okay? What hurts us today is we look around and we judge everything by our past. And I've told you before, if we continue to drive down the pathways of life looking in the rear view, we're going to run into a tree or a ditch somewhere. What's behind us, we can't control. What's in front of us, we have at least a fighting chance. And God allows us the privilege to enter into a relationship <coughs> with Him that can offer to us the privilege of satisfaction and fulfillment and joy and peace and love and happiness that money can't buy. And so God needs us and God wants us and God will use us. We should serve God because of a deep sense of appreciation and gratitude. Why? My past has been forgiven. My present has meaning and my future is secure. Hallelujah. We're also called to serve. This call to salvation and this call to service is not a one-time thing. The word is, has a sense of urgency. Can I help you? I was raised in the wrong era. My great-grandmother had a triangle in the back of her porch. Her back porch, there's 100 acres, 120 acres of land in the McCraney homestead. My Melissa's home was the main focus of the, of the spokes of the wheel. Uncle lived that way, aunt lived that way, cousin lived that way, kinfolk all around us. I'm a little bitty thing. I'm five, six, seven years old. Mama, granny, granny Lissy, needed me like Wells Fargo, you know what I'm saying, on Morning Express. We'd walk out the back door and she'd say, Sonny, boy, I need you to go see Aunt Darcy. And my grandma would stand on the back porch and she would yell. Y'all don't know about Woo! Woo! And Darcy, in a minute, would, you could see the back light flip on. And Aunt Darcy would, would hoot. Woo! And when she hooted back, that meant we got her attention. Amen? Can you follow me so far? So when she hooted back, my granny would pat me on the head and say, Take this to Aunt Darcy's. Well, between me and Aunt Darcy's is a great big holler and ditch. Okay? So when I was running, I could look back and I could see the lights at home behind me. And I could see Aunt Darcy's back porch in front of me. But when I hit that, that hole, I went into utter darkness. Do you know what that did? That made these little legs move a whole lot faster. Amen? <laughs> <laughs> when I popped up on the other side, it's like toast and a toast. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I popped up and I'm moving, man. And I would give to my Aunt Darcy's and then make her run back. Do you know that's how life is? That we're born into this world and we are called. And that call is answered on the other side. And while we're making this pilgrimage, we have to keep some things in focus. We have to keep our eye on the light, if you would. And we know, we know we've been called and sent. That's what missions is all about. And ministry too. God taps us on the shoulder and says this, son, daughter, I need you to go. I need you to go. I need you to go. And we look out to the darkened world and we see spotlights out there. Fireflies if you would. And we, 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 we see something that we focus on. Backpack blessings. Our Christmas boxes. Our cornerstone. Our, I missed one. Our youth. Or any other thing that we do. And as we, 
is we step off into the darkness and we take our focus on whatever it is and we run to involve ourselves in these ministries, we hear the call of God and the voices of others, I need you. I need you. It's not they need my money, though they do. They need me. They need me. They need my involvement. They need my excitement. They need my passion. God help us if we don't have passion about something. Amen? Amen. Do you have passion about something? Y'all help me. Do you have passion about anything? Y'all ask me about my nine foot, you hear me? Yeah. Y'all ask me about my nine foot. And I can tell you that I get excited about my nine foot. I love Jesus, do you? I get excited about Jesus, don't you? I get excited about mission. I get excited about mission. Why? Because I know that God is in it. I know that God can use us. I know that God can do great things. I know that God has a, a better, brighter idea than I do. And I know that God can use you to do all kinds of great things. And so we've been called. We've been commanded. And then one day, one day on the other side, the Bible tells us that we, we would stand before the Lord and every one of us would give an account of our lives to Him. My goodness. Have you ever read that scripture? you ever thought about that scripture? One day, one day, when you die, <coughs> do you realize when you die, you want to die? And when you shut up on this side and open up on the other side, I hope it's like we envisioned it. I believe it is this to some extent. But my Bible still tells me you've got some answers to do. I do too. And somewhere in this thing, I'm going to have a heart-to-heart -heart with Jesus. And you know what he's going to say? So, how many times did you go to church? I, I don't think that's going to be in the conversation. How much money did you put in the offering plate? I, I don't think that's going to be in the conversation. How many times did you... I don't think... Do you know the books of the Bible? I, I don't think any of that's going to be in the conversation. Do you know what I believe is going to be in the conversation? You hear me? What did you do for me? Amen. What did you do for me? And when we're standing before the Savior, it's not that, well, Lord, we didn't know it. This collective we will be irrelevant at that time because it ain't about the we and us. It's about me and you. What did I do for Jesus? What have you done for Jesus? What, have, what impact have I made? What sacrifice have I made? What mission have I been involved in? What ministry have I done? What have I done for Jesus? And if I stand on the other side, I will still go to heaven. Do you hear me? Because that's how God operates. Aren't you glad? But this working and serving Christ is not for His benefit, though it is. It's for the benefit of everybody down here. Because the only way that anybody gets up there is that somebody down here tells them how to get up there and we live in such a way and we work in such a way and we, we, we minister and involve ourselves in such a way that people see something about us that's different. Amen? Amen. If we're not different than any other thing, why would anybody want to come here? If our message is not different than any other message out there, why in the world do you, do you want to come? The reason we come is because it's a different message. Ain't about you, ain't about us. It's about Him. Amen? Amen. It's not about what you and I can do for Him and you and I can do for others. What can you do is the question. What can you do is the challenge. And as you and I answer those things, this is what I can do. This is what I will do. God says, I'll take it. I'll take you and I'll take it and I'll take your offerings. I'll take your gifts and sacrifices and I will use them to build my kingdom. I'll use them to, to touch lives, hallelujah. So what's your excuse? You realize it's not the duration of your life, but the donation of your life that matters? Abraham was old. Jacob was insecure. Leah, she was ugly. Unattractive, may I say. Moses was the next time a murderer. Gideon was poor. Samson was codependent. Rahab was immoral. David was an adulterer, a liar, and a murderer. Elijah was depressed. Jeremiah was emotional. Jonah was reluctant. Naomi was a widow, a widow with an attitude. John the Baptist was a little bit eccentric. Peter was stubborn, prickly, impulsive, and hot-tempered. Martha was a worry wolf. The Samaritan woman had a whole lot of failed marriages. Zacchaeus was somewhat unpopular. Thomas was a doubter. Paul had poor health. And Timothy was timid. So, what's your excuse? Now, I believe 
I've covered most of it. But just in, 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 in case I have it, may I say, you don't have it. You're not going to have it. God saved us so we can serve Him. Amen. Amen. Will you surrender? Will you submit? And will you serve? It's not that you won't get to heaven if you don't, but it will be. Your journey down here will be a whole lot more fun <laughs> if you do. Amen. Amen. Can I help you? Then I put up my hand. There's nothing that gives me more joy than to have these little ones. They run up and they grab me by my leg and they hug onto my leg and they look up and they call me by my name. And they do that because undoubtedly I've, made, I've done something right, right? And, I, and, and you, you shake my hand, you hug my neck, you smile to me, you love me, right? Well, undoubtedly I've done something right. And because of that, is your life better? I know mine is. I know that had I not been sitting here, had I not been given the privilege to invest the last six years with you, I know that my life would be totally void in some ways because my life has been blessed immeasurably because God has allowed me the privilege of being a <coughs> pastor. But you're afraid to be here, Mr. And so I thank God for the privilege of knowing Him and serving Him and obeying Him and submitting to Him and surrendering to Him and the call to mission and ministry because you're part of that call to mission and ministry. It says we bend the knee and we bow the, the head in just a few minutes. In common unity of what we call communion, I remind you. There's nothing special.